For over three decades, Marianne Tai has been shaping the New York market, specifically Manhattan and beyond, in ways that are incredible to see. It's been an incredible long storied career. She's transformed neighborhoods from downtown to Times Square to Hudson Yards. And she's been doing that while she's also CEO of the New York region of CBRE, managing over 2,500 people. So Marianne, thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure. Marianne, t tell me a little bit about this, this sort of juggling these roles. You're still a very active broker. and You're also managing a company, a public company. In, you're managing the New York division. How do you juggle those? How do you stop yourself from making deals when you need to take care of the shop? So l let me um, sort of give you the, the, the history of the role. Um, in 2002, I left what was then my historic firm. I had been with a company that was the Edward S. Gordon Company and became Insignia. Mm -hmm. And I left to go to CBRE to take over their New York operation. At that point, ESG was, uh, or, or is Insignia ESG, was number one in the marketplace. And depending on your metrics, CBRE was number four or five mm -hmm. uh, in the market. And so in those early years, I would say 2001, excuse me, 2002 through maybe 2006, mm -hmm. my focus was really on um, building the CBRE presence in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, the good news is it's worked spectacularly. Mm -hmm. um, the other side of it was I had to withdraw from the day-to-day -day management of the operation. Mm -hmm. And what would I do otherwise but do deals? In terms of the actual deal making, in terms of the actual business of brokerage, right. putting people into buildings, right. how involved are you at the moment? Oh, uh, I would tell you that that is 80% of my life, mm -hmm. my day job, mm -hmm. is doing that. The work that I do with the larger enterprise of CBRE and with Matt and, and Mike is probably uh, somewhere between 15 and 20%. But I have, um, you know, I, I have to say the beauty of it to me um, is that. I can report sort of from the ground. Mm -hmm. I can say, you know what we're not doing right, or you know what's happening in the market with this trend or that trend. And the market is changing so rapidly mm -hmm. that it really makes a big difference. I think, I think part of our, our, our secret sauce is that um, we're, really, we're really sort of got our finger on it uh, mm -hmm. just day by day. So when you, when you started at CB uh, in 2002, this is right after 9-11. Yes the faith in the New York market has been rattled. How do you build a business as well as tell people, look, New York is open for business. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, you came from, you have a background in government relations. Yes. So you had a sense of who the players were and mm -hmm. how to navigate them. But that, I mean, that's a seismic event that, how do you navigate that? I was curious. I, I have to say to you, um, as, as sort of perversely, um, I believed from the, the terrible moment of 9-11 on that it was a singular moment of opportunity for the city mm -hmm. after this immense tragedy. I like to think um, that second to Larry Silverstein, who I saw him actually on the evening of 9-11, mm -hmm. and... Um, he had missed uh, an appointment because yes. his wife had sent him somewhere, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. I saw him, I, I ran into him, he was about to um, go into a place to have dinner, and I ran into him on the street on the Upper East Side, and I saw him and I didn't say, you know, we were standing in front of each other and I began to cry. Mm -hmm. And he put his arms around me and said, sweetheart, we're gonna rebuild. This is six o'clock on the night of 9-11. I like to think that so much of my uh, positive uh, response to it um, has been as a consequence of that moment. You know, you saw a tremendous leasing activity in the area. Mm -hmm. You saw some incredible leases like Spotify coming to the World Trade Center, however, there's been some setbacks as well. But one of the big names that if it had you know, come to pass in downtown would have been a major coup, would have really established it as a media and power hub, right. which was News Corp, 20, 21st Century Fox. Right. They were coming to World Trade Center, they signed an LOI, mm -hmm. uh, and then they backed out. And because of that, Larry still hasn't been able to build that tower. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about what that meant for downtown. Okay, so um, I wanna start by telling you that I represent uh, 21st Century Fox mm -hmm. and News Corp, and I represented them in that deal. Mm -hmm. And basically what transpired is we came all the way to the end. Uh, construction was actually slated to begin two weeks after uh, uh, Rupert Murdoch called Larry on, on January 15th and said um, that 
he just didn't feel that the time was right for them to make the commitment. Mm -hmm. Look what's happened since then. Mm -hmm. The decision he's made uh, to uh, to sell, uh, not all, mm -hmm. by the way, but a, a significant chunk of 21st Century right. Fox. And whatever uh, intuition he had, you have to sort of bow to a person of that astonishing achievement mm -hmm. that this is what got him to where he is, and whatever his instincts are, they proved to be right. Because that new company would not be able to fill the commitment that he had he was looking yes. for. Yes, right? I mean, interestingly, the, um, uh, Fox will still have, uh, first of all, News Corp is a separate sure. company entirely, yeah. mm -hmm. but Fox will continue to have a significant New York presence because mm -hmm. he's retaining Fox News and the uh, Fox channels, et cetera, so they'll be here. Mm -hmm. But you try not to sell your soul too many times in life, right? Yes, yeah. and so I think that whether he had the intuition of it or just felt that the moment might be right for him to do this, mm -hmm. he pressed the pause button, and that's what happened. Um, so let me, let, but let me go back to the World Trade Center because I feel like we are so overdue uh, a change in the narrative. Mm -hmm. Let me begin by saying that uh, when the Trade Center uh, was to come into existence. You're dealing with, first of all, a part of Manhattan that everybody defined long ago, downtown. We all know what downtown means, right? People still say Wall Street. People still think the streets roll up at night. People have a very clear vision of downtown and basically New Yorkers don't go there. Mm -hmm. That's been the historic character of downtown. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Number two, we have uh, maybe the greatest tragedy to ever befall um, our nation happen there. And so the next thing that happens are all the um, constituents who relate to the site, whether it be the families, the Port Authority, the, the leaseholder in Larry's case, the city of New York, everybody gets into um, disputes, uh, different points of view, et cetera. So the early years of rebuilding set a narrative of uh, it's downtown, it, um, you know, chaos reigns, mm -hmm. and, and the Port Authority is overspending, mm -hmm. and Larry's asking too much rent. A famous uh, moment when we were doing Seven was the mayor coming out saying that uh, Larry's asking too much rent for Seven. We were like, what? Mm -hmm. um, and so we have this ongoing uh, um, story building right. that becomes solidified right. over and, time. And the media scrutiny on what should, what would normally Absolutely. have been a real estate deal becomes a lot bigger. It's a national story, Absolutely. right? And you have books, that, you might have read uh, Power at Ground Zero. I surely did, right? so which I thought was excellent, by the way. It was very good, but, yeah. but the, there was a lot of criticism about how the subsidies were put together, how the financing was put together Absolutely. for what is, at the end of the day, a private project for private developer. Exactly right. So we've been stuck with this unfortunate narrative. I'm gonna give you an example that, to me, just typifies it. If I hear one more person tell me that the Oculus at $4 billion was a big waste of money, mm -hmm. I want to say pause. And let me point out that the number seven line, which is one stop, mm -hmm. cost $2 billion. Mm -hmm. One line, one stop. Now, do I think, by the way, it was money well spent, that $2 billion? You bet. Everything outside your door here mm -hmm. shows you how well spent it was. But I'm not hearing anybody say, Two billion dollars, or how about Second Avenue? Three well, people talk about that. Three stops, mm -hmm. three stops, plus one renovation, four point two billion dollars. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about what the Oculus is. It's a place where twelve subway lines come together, mm -hmm. plus the PATH train, and it's an active shopping mall that generates significant rent every year for the Port Authority. How is that for? By the way, all of them are too much money mm -hmm. because we are in a situation where the constraints that are placed on anybody building these things, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the New York Times did a brilliant, brilliant series of pieces right. on why we are the most expensive place to build mass transit mm -hmm. in the world. Right, by multiples. It's, by it's, multiples, yeah. mm -hmm. and also the slowest. Mm -hmm. And what I have to say to you is, why is the Oculus the symbol of that? To mm -hmm. me, the Oculus, has produced value already up the kazoo. So I'd say all of this story to tell you, do you know what breaks the narrative, the only thing that breaks it? When people come downtown. How much of a role do tax breaks play in that calculus? And Absolutely. how much of a Absolutely. role do you as a broker play in, in sort of 
easing that through or maybe talking to the right people and explaining why this is a good bet. I, I just, I'm not, uh, by not the familiar way, of how that works. 100% mm -hmm. um, Because tax if you look breaks, at BlackRock here, there's a 25 million uh, tax break that I think they're right. getting. But, it's part of the game. But let me, let me say to you that tax breaks are part of the magic of the Trade Center. Mm -hmm. To me, the greatest tax break of all is the way the real estate taxes were constructed. Mm -hmm. Because while the yards have a tax benefit, you know that it burns off and it also only applies um, at, at different levels to the first five or 10 million square feet. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not intended to diminish for one second uh, the work that's been done in Hudson Yards and Manhattan West, which well, you were been, part of that too. I right? have <laughs> indeed, which I think is amazing. Yeah. But let me tell you the, in long analysis, what's the difference? We have here virgin territory. Mm -hmm. There was nothing here but rail, op open rail cut. That's number one. Number two, we were building new product here mm -hmm. and inventing a new place in Manhattan. And I think people, as we know, BlackRock an example, they were looking to house their place, their, their business, in a place that was new. People mm -hmm. came as tourists mm -hmm. to Hudson Yards and Manhattan West because they didn't know what to expect. So they, again, and when you got here, you were appropriately dazzled. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think the, the, the answer is that the more people that come to the Trade Center, mm -hmm. the more, we, we will fill up three just the way we filled up four. Mm -hmm. And what happens to two, though? Uh, we will find an anchor for two. I, mm -hmm. Again, I have to say, as I, as I often say down on tours at the Trade Center, when people say, gee, I don't know if we can pioneer. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's code for coming downtown from Midtown, which mm -hmm. I think is hilarious. That's good. I say, if you're a block and a half from a Four Seasons Hotel, you're not a pioneer. Mm -hmm. So I think, and by the way, the, the dynamic of downtown is also profoundly different. I will challenge you on that. You've been to the World Trade Center more times than probably anyone alive, but that retail space, that's still a challenge. That is a real challenge. Uh, I wouldn't go as far as saying ghost town, but that's certainly been said. There are a lot of sh uh, stores that are yet to open. There's a lot of lawsuits happening in that space. It isn't active in the way that you would want to see if you're an office tenant. Are they taking stock of what's happening in retail in general? You walk through a space, you look at stuff, but you don't necessarily buy there because you're going somewhere else in the city, especially mm -hmm. as a tourist. You're mm -hmm. not, you don't want to lug packages around. You, c you can go, check out the product, and then go online. And so, how do you compete with that when you're trying to fill this incredible amount of space? You know, I, I can tell you that it depends on, it's a retailer by retailer situation. Mm -hmm. It also depends on what the mix of product is. I can tell you the Apple store in the Oculus right. is doing just well. Picked, Marianne, you picked the one product that is just, that is, has it, a story that is so compelling. Well, let me also say something very important. So we have Tower 4 and Tower 3. And Tower 3, 700,000 square feet of Group M. 6,000 people mm -hmm. will move in there next month. Spotify, 2,500 people mm -hmm. will move in. These people are not there yet. These buildings mm -hmm. are, with, with some exceptions, of course, uh, again, not Tower 1, but these buildings are pretty much empty. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, all of these people are going to come, I don't know, call me crazy, another eight, 9,000 people with internal connection to it, it might actually impact sales. And so to sum up, you're not worried about the magnetic field of Hudson Yards as much because you think no, their I, own I also their think New Yorkers can walk and chew gum at the same time. You know, they, <laughs> it, it, the idea is you're going to look at everything and uh -huh. you should look at everything mm -hmm. because the dynamic of the places are going to be very, very different. That's fair. So let's talk a little bit more broadly about the New York market. I sure. think people always ask investment sales brokers, how does this look as a destination for foreign capital and maybe capital from other parts of the um, U.S.? New York continues to be an incredible magnet. Uh, different mixes of capital, that's also part of the magic of New York. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the Chinese that were so for such a force in this market uh, certainly are investing less capital, but the Chinese tourist population is booming mm -hmm. in this market. The mix has changed so that now we have the Canadians here mm -hmm. in force. Look for at what Brookfield is doing, it's extraordinary. They're just... They're uh, first of all, Brookfield is obviously made under... Uh, under Rick Clark, a series of brilliant mm. bets mm -hmm. on the city. But on development as well, not just buying, which is their Absolutely. normal bread and butter. It's oh, no, no. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we're just across the street from here mm -hmm. where we're sitting today. If you see that, and part of what's happening is because their development is such a success, um, if, you know, if you think of the old 450 West 33rd, now 5, Hudson, uh, five Manhattan West, mm -hmm. um, you see that they're just going to harvest 
a capital off of that. Same things happening at One Manhattan West. Mm -hmm. So they're going to keep reinvesting in the city and expanding their reach. And I think part of it is that we are still a, a world capital business center. Mm -hmm. And that even as the, um, the financial service part of, of the world has resh reshaped itself, mm -hmm. new businesses have taken hold in a very dramatic way. Right. So the resiliency of New York um, is absolutely, I think probably for foreign capital, it's number one charm along with part of that resiliency is the, is the basic rule of law. Mm -hmm. Because I have to say, what can't possibly be a market, uh, be a magnet, is how hard it is to get anything done mm -hmm. in New York. Mm -hmm. So Marty Berger, uh, someone you worked with very closely, had so said something on our panel, it was fascinating, he said, if you look at the, the new office stock coming up in New York, London, you see, you know, the certain percentage every year. New York, only 7% of the office stock is being replenished. Right. That's extraordinary. I, I think you always have to say these things in context. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me say it to sure. you this way. It, the Manhattan office stock sure. is 400 million square feet. Mm -hmm. The Hong Kong office stock, he made that analogy, is I think about 68 million square feet. London even is 225 million. So our scale in terms of the percentage but Marty is absolutely right in the substance. Mm -hmm. Why is that the case? Look at our zoning. Mm -hmm. If we hadn't done the Midtown East rezoning, that whole section of Midtown, mm -hmm. I, I can tell you that a lot of the benefit that has come to the World Trade Center, Dotson Yards to Manhattan West, has been because of the 1961 zoning mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, is in, that was in Midtown East and that kept our buildings vintage. Mm -hmm. And now with the, the, the change of that, now it's gonna take a long time for it to roll out. Mm -hmm. You know, people say, oh, when are we gonna see the first building? Yeah. By the way, Chase is gonna be the first building. Right. God bless them. Mm -hmm. um, and I asked Jamie Dimon last week, uh, I had occasion to, to talk with him. You're talking about 270, 270 Park? Uh, 270 yeah. Park. Mm -hmm. I asked him, you know, it's a big decision, not, not inexpensive. To uh, take down a skyscraper of that size. Yeah, but let rebuild. me tell you something. Right. You gotta move everybody out. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to move everybody back. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you just doing the math on that, it's never the cheapest solution. And he said, um, um, right away, he said, uh, the rezoning changed it for me. Mm -hmm. He said, I have, the, I have 6,000 people in 270 today. He said, when, because of the rezoning, I'll eventually have 15,000 people in this building. And it's fabulous for me to have all my people together mm -hmm. like this. Th it's that kind of investment that was impossible until the rezoning. Mm -hmm. So I, I, again, I think one of the things that people always forget when they look at a lot of, pro of projects sort of on the drawing board is this is New York. It doesn't Chase. happen fast. Mm -hmm. You know, as I said, Chase will be the first building. Mm -hmm. And if they're lucky, five years, maybe six. I think so. Uh, and uh, I will come back to this question of New York, but you said something when you were talking about Jamie Dimon, you yeah. said Jamie. When you were talking about Rupert Murdoch and 21st Century Fox, you said Rupert. Mm -hmm. How comfortable are you navigating power like that? And how have you become that comfortable with it? I know you came from a background in government. You have to understand that I am a person who grew up in the South Bronx working for a working class family. And um, I, I never even flew in an airplane until I was 18 years of age. When I was in my early 20s, by the strangest fluke, um, I got a job in the White House. So figure that I'm 24 years of age, I get to work for um, Mondale, it's Carter, Carter Mondale, that's how old I am, the Carter Mondale White House. Mm -hmm. And a year later, I'm made by the, uh, the Carter uh, Mondale administration, I'm made deputy chairman of, a, of uh, the National Endowment for the Arts. Mm -hmm. And I end up having to go up to Congress to present our annual budget um, and argue the passage, obviously, of what we were recommending for a budget for the endowment. I'm proud to say in those days, the endowment had, had a real budget. Mm. Um, so I would tell you that, you know, there's nothing like knowing the vice president, and I knew, um, uh, and still do, actually, uh, I still call him Mr. Vice President, not Fritz Mondale. You know, honestly, if you've worked in the White House, I don't think you're ever intimidated again. Mm -hmm. uh, the miracle of the White House is, that everybody shows up at your doorstep and... Everyone takes your call. Er, everyone takes, uh -huh. and in the old days... And when you're a broker canvassing, not many people will take your that's call. That's right. That experience of government and, and the sense of 
we're all just people. And everybody is actually just a person. Mm -hmm. Does allow you, it gives you the, the comfort. So um, how, do you, how do you take that knowledge and maybe translate it to people that you're mentoring? Or other women in the industry that you hope to see come up, right? What do you do when you have a, a junior female broker who you know, grew up in Long Island? How do you say, I, look, it's, it's important I, that I, you can do this? What I would say to you is they need to connect themselves to somebody who can bring them into the room. Mm -hmm. You have to get into the room where it happens. That's, that's, by the way, not just true about brokerage. It's true in all business, right? Mm -hmm. You have to have a point of entry to that. And I can tell you, and I think of the, uh, the women in my own firm, uh, whether it's Lauren Crowley Coronet or Romney Greeky or Sarah Pontius, these are CBRE women, um, they have that access. And is that enough, these, these sort of circles of support that have, have mm -hmm. popped up and evolved, is that enough? You had to power through a lot of things. And a lot of things that are in the conversation now uh, weren't even... That, that didn't exist. You wouldn't talk about you know, inappropriate behavior or comments or things like that. I'm thinking specifically about what happened with Sam Zell a few weeks ago, right. two weeks ago. Sam Zell has said this stuff all his life. The only thing that's changed is people are calling him out on it now. Right. Where do you think we stand as an industry when it comes to issues of gender diversity, sexual harassment, addressing problems head on, and where would you like to see it go? Well, certainly, I, I want to say to you that there is a spectrum that when things normalize a bit more, mm -hmm. we're going to begin to acknowledge. It's, it's a very different thing if it, we're talking about any kind of physical aggression. It's a very different thing if we're talking about using power to get something you want in a sexual sense and thereby diminishing somebody. If you're talking about chat, which I'm going to tell you is where I put the Sam Zell uh, quote, this is not uh, worth the heartbeats. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but tell me, I mean, you've seen this in brokerage, and you talked about physical violence. I, I, there are instances that we've heard about that well, people are afraid, but there have been instances of physical violence as well. And there has to be a zero tolerance mm -hmm. policy for that at any firm. Mm -hmm. But I, I want to tell you that on the, on the verbal side, sure. I am a believer that part of, of the responsibility falls to the person to the woman listening to it. It is so part of the DNA of our industry. I got a phone call Thursday night last week. I'm, I'm uh, out at dinner. It's nine and change at night. And I get on with the broker who shall remain nameless who says he wants to, we're, we're negotiating a deal and he wants to do this, that, and the other. We sent him a request for proposal. And so I'm, I'm, I'm tired. And I'm, I'm thinking, why is he calling me about this on my cell at this hour of the night? And I say, um, do me a favor. Just follow the expletive form. Do not be calling me about this. Mm -hmm. And he says, has anyone told you how sexy you are when you curse? Okay? And I say to him, I'm sure you tell that to Bob Alexander as well. <laughs> so that was the end of that uh -huh. conversation. Uh -huh. He well, wasn't speaking from a position of power. Correct. You're speaking from a position, if you try some I, shit with what, me, what, forgive me, if you try some shit with me, I Can, can I tell you something? Yeah. But that is exactly what I hope we are empowering. I'm now talking about our industry. We are empowering the women in our industry to turn around and say, really? Mm -hmm. Don't do that again. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that one of the positive effects of the hashtag MeToo era is the idea of public shaming that could well end up in termination, mm -hmm. et cetera. So I think that a woman who pushes back at that moment, what she has behind her mm -hmm. is the impact of what's been happening over the last year or so. And she needs to be able to use that force. Again, I'm not for making it a major incident. I'm for like pushing it back. And if it goes beyond that, then you escalate. Mm -hmm. But in the first instance, these are people just saying stupid stuff that's coming out of their mouth. And you just need to, to retrain them. Although you're not going to retrain a 76-year-old man. I see that. Look at the entertainment industry, right? Starting with Harvey Weinstein and then all yes. the dominoes. Topics. Yes. Look at media, right? Look at real estate. Yes. You really think that that's all we've got? You really think that there's no big reckonings to be had? No one could be clearer on this than I, mm -hmm. um, that it's something that the industry needs to correct. Um, and, and also, I don't think anybody has a deeper understanding 
that there is no single action that will do it. It's each of us dealing with it on a case-by-case -case basis and letting the punishment fit the crime. Mm -hmm. um, because I don't want um, a world in which, it's funny, I have a, a nephew who just turned 21. And uh, I said to him, Elliot, um, it must be hard to date today because, you know, you just don't know what vibes, you know, are coming back and forth. He said, oh, no, um, he calls me auntie. No, no, auntie, I don't have a problem. So I said, really, Elliot, why is that? He said, because I talk to women. And it was this interesting moment where I realized he was absolutely right. He was having conversations with women so that he felt like he had some idea. I want us to be in a world where we're conversing with one another and that we're not on a hunt. But if someone steps over the line or you feel that they have, that you feel empowered enough to confront it. And if that's not enough, you feel also that you've got a firm that has your back and is going to act on it. Mm -hmm. So you talked about CBRE, uh, public company, biggest, I believe, uh, yes. commercial real estate services firm in the world. Uh, you're up against a very interesting competition now. Two of your major competitors, both on sales and leasing, have either gone public, I'm thinking Newmark, or are in the process of going public, mm -hmm. Cushman and Wakefield. How does that change the game for you as a competitor, and how does it change the game for the industry? Do you see uh, maybe a greater degree of professionalism coming in, more M&A activity? What's, what's your take on the business of brokerage? So I agree completely that M&A is, there's more M&A coming. Mm -hmm. I think it is impossible to compete uh, in commercial brokerage today, and I'm talking commercial brokerage um, specifically, without having uh, both a diversity, a real diversity of capability and a significant footprint. Mm -hmm. If you are not able to provide all of it, lease administration, facilities management, project management, um, and obviously a uh, transactional business both on the uh, investment sales side, if, if you can't handle ground up development, I mean, I could go down the list of things, you will bit by bit being, be eliminated from the pool of contenders. Mm -hmm. It's just the way it is. Do you need to be public to do that? You could be a company of some scale, yeah, let's say I mean, if, you, if you or... have access to capital, mm -hmm. um, you know, but then you've got private equity money, mm -hmm. which is, as you know, very expensive money. And that produces a whole series of other dynamics. The TPG with Cushman, they've loaded it up with debt. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, it's certainly, you know, we're sitting in a very comfortable place. How many years has CBRE been a public company? I'll tell you what I look forward to. I look forward to the transparency. Mm -hmm. Because obviously our numbers are out there to be seen, not necessarily city by city, but whatever. And I'm, I'm often amused by the claims our um, competitors make mm -hmm. that I know are absolutely not true. Mm -hmm. That it will be nice to have, it, not every instance, but in many instances, public documents where you can say, really, did they say that? Here's their file, most recent filing. Take a look at actually what they're telling uh, their shareholders in the public markets. So we talked about Eastern shutting down, but, it, but, a, but a firm that made it, in a sense, is RKF. Yes. New Mark bought RKF. Yes, absolutely. Cushman is probably out there looking for other firms to purchase. Yeah. Uh, is that the model? You think it's going to be more and more consolidation? So you go from... I do. You go to three firms or... I do. Mm -hmm. um, I think that um, it's very hard to build um, an enterprise mm -hmm. of scale. And I think that that's ultimately, I, mean, I think the end game for a lot of the smaller and mid-sized firms is to be bought. Don't you miss having a massy knackle in the market? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the issue of, if you will, neighborhood brokerage. Mm -hmm. um, the thing I loved best about, I mean, I like the guys, but I, I, I also loved the notion of knowing the outer boroughs block by block, right. the way we know Manhattan, mm -hmm. uh, the way we've come to know parts of Brooklyn. There's no substitute for that. It's great. So you talked about, uh, you know, often doing deals before they're public deals or visible deals. Mm -hmm. One of the deals that I think recently won a lot of acclaim for, I think it was your ninth Ingenious Award at Rebney, yeah. was 498 7th Avenue. Right. Uh, talk about that. Why was it, I mean, of all the complex deals that you do, why was that? Why did that stand out? There were, you know, um, I often joke about deal of the year. I'll say, to, I always remember saying this to my colleague, Mike Lagenestra where he congratulated me on winning one of the awards. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, I wish it for you next year, Mike. He said, oh no, I don't want it. And I laughed because I said, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Because to get it, you have to do something that is, um, 
you know, outside, uh, uh, e e an outsized complexity. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about this. One. So 498, that union is made up of two entities. Mm -hmm. The union, which we think of as are the people who are an enormous political force here in the city, and their job is to fight for good wages, um, you know, good regulation, things that will support uh, their members' uh, compensation and working conditions. The other side are the funds, the people who harvest the pension payments made by the people who employ the union workers and manage that money and then provide for them and their families into old age. Now this sounds like it's one entity, when in fact the nature of the uses are profoundly different. The union uh, has always had its own building, and not always, but has had it for um, over 50 years, and was able, if there was going to be a march or uh, they needed to print things up, they, they rallied right at the building and went off. The, the building where the funds were are a place where, literally in the course of a year, hundreds of thousands of people came mm. to meet with people who were going to advise them on their pensions, advise them on their medical care, get retraining, do all manners of things. But it's a, it's a grand central station of people traffic. coming back and mm -hmm. forth. So th there is a misalignment, if you will, between the nature of the uses. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. The second thing is that really for regulatory reasons, there needed to be a separation between who was acting on behalf of each of these. Uh, the, you know, so this was a deal where there were two sets of brokers, mm -hmm. two sets of, of architects, two sets of engineers, two sets uh, of um, attorneys who did the lease, two sets of incentive attorneys who had to get into sync with each other even though what each side needed was different. Mm -hmm. Now... And are you, in, in, in the course of this deal, do you have to quickly become an expert on each aspect of that transaction? Yeah, I mean, one of the neat, one of, what's one of the great things about our business? Mm -hmm. In order to really do a good job for anybody mm -hmm. you're doing it for, you actually need to understand their business. Mm -hmm. And the more deeply you understand their business, the higher probability that you're going to make a happy outcome for them. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, it's the idea of diving into somebody else's world that makes brokerage, among other things, so attractive. Mm -hmm. Anyway, go back to the union and uh, the pension fund. So as this thing is going on, it went on for five and a half years, believe me, you don't even, you know, um, I'm doing the, uh, with my colleagues, uh, doing the Group M deal down at the Trade Center. And I'm going in and out of Group M's headquarters at... 498 7th Avenue. Mm. And as I'm going in and out, I'm observing the building. The building was two buildings put together. It had a ton, it has, not had, it has a ton of elevators. It has multiple points of entry. It has a phenomenal loading dock, crazy things that you, you know, you notice in the course of your work. And it's, it's got huge floor loads and it's a bear of a building. And I think to myself one day while I'm sitting in a Group M meeting, you know, this is this will work great for eleven ninety nine. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Now, getting so like from, an anthropological aspect yes, in this business as well. That yes, you're talking about, right? but getting from that thought mm -hmm. to getting the, both sides to think about it, mm -hmm. because the first time we presented it, they're like, "No, this doesn't work for us." One of the hardest things is to make to make the visual clear to people who are not necessarily, you know, all of us know the world. I always say there's always a sense that's dominant in how you, you perceive the world. You can show them even renderings and they're like, I always love when you show somebody a plan, then you walk in the space and they say, is this wall going to stay here? Mm -hmm. And you're like, no, no, I, I, <laughs> no. But, but you understand who you're dealing with mm -hmm. at that point, somebody who's brilliant at what they do, but this is not what they do. So the first time we present it, it, it doesn't pass muster. 498 7th is now going to be transformed into a building that will serve both the and different entrances and mm -hmm. on and on and on different elevators, but they'll all be together and it will be a first for this great union. Well, Mary Antai, thank you so much. Thank you.